The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. We're here with Dr. Temple Grandin. We're so thrilled to be here with her. I want to let everybody know that we pre-recorded this yesterday. So please write in your comments right now, but know that this is pre-recorded. Um, but we are so delighted to air this on Tuesday, the 11th of October, 2022, because it is officially the launch of Dr. Grandin's new book, which we're gonna be talking about during this episode. The name of the book is Visual Thinking. The subtitle is The Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstractions. We are so proud to have the author with us. She is a New York Times bestselling author. And this book is already the number one bestseller in its division on Amazon and it hasn't even come out yet, Dr. Grant. And how does that feel? Oh, I'm just really, really happy about that. And I think the book's going to help a lot of people. On, and I've done a lot of talk to, talks to businesses. And they ask me, what's the most important thing we can learn? The most important thing you can learn is that different kinds of thinking exist. Mm -hmm. When I was in my 20s, uh, I wanted to look at what cattle were seeing. And that cattle would stop at shadows. And people thought that was kind of crazy. I didn't know at that time that other people didn't think visually. I did not know that until I was in my late thirties. And in my book, Visual Thinking, I'm gonna discuss scientific research behind what's called an object visualizer like me, the visual spatial mathematical pattern thinker, and then of course the word thinker. Yeah. And there's scientific research that shows these different kinds of thinking exist. And most people are mixtures, but kids with autism, adults with autism, dyslexia, ADHD, you're more likely to have maybe an extreme mathematician, which is not my mind, or an extreme object visualizer like me, where everything is thought about in a picture. It's fascinating. You know, it was many years ago after my son had first been diagnosed that I saw you speaking on this topic, but a much earlier version of this where you were talking about the different types of thinkers. It was revolutionary to me at that time, T Temple, because I certainly wasn't thinking of even how I wasn't thinking about the fact that the way I thought is perhaps different from somebody else. And I certainly wasn't thinking about how my child was thinking differently. But as soon as you started talking about it, it made so much sense. And I, as a parent, began looking at my child and the way he reacted to things in a different way. And I know that part of the part of the thing with this book, the praise across the 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 whole spectrum of everybody who's praising this book, scientists are changing, are praising it. People who are on the spectrum are praising it. Parents are praising it. As you said, um, people who are hiring are praising it and saying it's so elucidating. So maybe we can delve into this a little bit and help people that maybe, I can't believe that there are still people who think that we all think alike, but for somebody who thinks that, where do you start with them, Temple, to explain? Do you start with explaining how your brain works? I start with explaining how my brain works where everything is a picture. So my cattle work, I looked at what cattle were looking at and I found if you got a rope out of a facility that was hanging down in their face, uh, they were more likely to walk through the shoot to get vaccinated. And I didn't realize at the time that maybe to the verbal thinker that wasn't so obvious. Now, I went back through all my jobs. I have designed equipment for every major meat company. And on many of those jobs, I spent significant amounts of times out on big construction sites. They're building these great big meat factories. And I went through and I figured out that about 20% of the very skilled machinery designers, people with multiple patents, welders and drafting people that drew entire factories were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD, about 20% of them, all undiagnosed. And most of these individuals could not do algebra. Right. Now they graduated from high school, started with a welding class, or they started with fixing cars as their entrance uh, into it. And the thing that worries me is these individuals are not getting replaced. Yeah. We've got a huge skill loss right now. This is what I tell businesses. And you need to hire the neurodiverse minds because you need them. 
yeah. the thing is, when you have a kid with a label, the skill will tend to be more extreme, more extreme object visualizer, a more extreme mathematician. And what I found working in these factories is that my kind of mind, some of them were barely graduated from high school, were doing all what I call the clever engineering, packaging equipment, mechanically clever equipment. And then the degreed engineers were doing the more mathematical parts, boilers, refrigeration, snow load on the roof, wind load on the building, water and power. And I found this division of labor and engineering in every single job I was on, doesn't matter who the meat company was. And what I'm worried about is my kind of mind, since we can't do algebra, we're getting screened out. And right yeah. now, if you want to buy a poultry processing plant, the equipment's going to come from Holland. Mm -hmm. And that's because we took shop classes and all of the hands-on classes out of the schools 20 years ago. And we are paying for it right now. And the problem is the little shops are not forming and the people are all retiring, not getting replaced. It's really serious. Yeah. And right now, the shops that are left, there's a few that are left, they are price gouging like you wouldn't believe. I've got to be pretty vague about this because I yeah. do have confidentiality issues with clients. Yeah. There's so much in what you said that we need to unpack, though. Let's go back to the beginning. And for me, that if I'm... a you know, I'm a person and I'm a parent and I think a certain way, as you said, maybe a mixture of a lot of different things. Yeah. Most people, most people are mixtures, <clears throat> but the kids that have the labels tend to be an extreme. And then even the people that are mixtures, one kind of thinking kind of predominance because Betsy Lerner, my co-author is super verbal thinker. So I do the rough draft for our book, visual thinking. And then I'm, I'm, Betsy would take it and reorganize it. Yeah. You see, we were working together really well. And we both learned more about how different our brains work. Oh, and I we love that. Great team. We are a great team. Complementary skills. Let's yeah. take this uh, uh, rest stream studio we're using right now. Very easy yeah. to use. Other yeah. video things are horrible to use. So my kind of mind would make the, the um, surface, the interaction the interface and the mathematician has to program it. You let right. the mathematician make the interface, they put too many features on it, they get it so complicated that nobody can use it. Absolutely. So if I'm a parent though, and I'm looking at my kiddo, what are the signs that would point to me that I've got, let's say I've got a four-year-old. I uh, am not going to tell the kind of thinker in a four-year-old. That, okay. Yeah. When can I uh, tell? I them? would say there are some exceptions to that, but my ability in art started showing up around second and third grade. Okay. And, and what that, am I looking for, Dr. Graham? Well, I was good at drawing. And then I spent hours tinkering with little kites when I was seven and eight years old. And that's why I did my book, Calling All Minds, which is about all my little parachutes and kites that I made when I was a child, spent hours tinkering. So the visual thinkers, they're good at art and they like to build things. And then the mathematical kids will start to be good at math and they need to be moved ahead in math. And one of the things they do to the little autistic math geniuses that's really bad is instead of letting them just look at the formula and do it in their head, they force them to do it sequentially. That is not how their minds work. They need to be just moved ahead into higher math is what you need to do with kids that are math geniuses. And their opposite traits, object visualizer and the mathematical uh, kid, um, but you got to expose kids to stuff to find out what they're good at. Yeah. So you take out theater, sewing, cooking, woodworking, art, music, all of these things. You won't find out what they're good at. Yeah. I, I was introduced to a little flute. I couldn't play the thing. You give it to another kid, they'll pick it up and play it. Right. But you have to be exposed. Well, this or is just what we what were talking about yesterday on the show, about how important it is to give kids a wide exposure, especially exactly. to the arts, because you never know what's going to be the thing that sings to them. You just well, can't you just even I've worked with people that have 20 patents where a single welding class started their career. And yeah. a lot of the ones that I worked with, they can't do algebra. It's screening them out. And I've got a whole chapter in visual thinking called Screened Out. Yeah, talk and about screened out for a second because people may not understand what you mean by that What term, I mean by that out. is I don't think I could graduate from high school today mm. because I can't do algebra. And I often thought about a mind experiment that I could do. Let's say I'm 75 now, but let's say somebody waved a magic wand and I'm now 18 years old, low income situation, but I was kept all my knowledge. I got all my knowledge. Oh, they're building this huge warehouse thing uh, outside of town here. It's probably going to have all kinds of automated equipment in it. 
I'd head right over there and get a job mm. because I know I could end up designing the next one because wow. I've seen people in the meat industry start out in the maintenance department 15 years later, they're project manager for the new cooler. Another person start out and become a manager. I've seen people work up in my industry and you can do that. In every industry It's called the back door. Okay. And I know exactly how to get in the back door and you have to start out doing just hard work, maybe unload trucks or something like that. You're going to have to pay your dues. Yeah. But that's where I would go if I couldn't graduate from high school. But in this screened out thing, what we but the see screened is... out thing, what's happening no. in the screen up. So the kid can't graduate from high school. I'll tell you what's happening is the visual thinkers who should be building things. Yeah. They're playing video games in the basement on disability check. I wish that they were getting fabulous jobs in the video game industry, but they're not. I wish they were. If they were, I wouldn't yeah. criticize it. Right. Because right now I want to see the kids that think differently um, to get out and get into good careers where they can do something constructive and careers that they're going to like. Yeah. That's yeah. why I'm doing this book. And I also have chapters in there on why we need my kind of mind. I can't do algebra. I have a whole chapter on, on yeah. disasters. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because I think people don't understand. People get so rigid, Dr. Grandin, and oh, thinking, I know. well, it needs to be this way. Well, it gets too rigid. And I tell business people, the first thing you have to realize is know that these different thinkers exist. I researched the Fukushima nuclear reactor meltdown. There is no way I could design a nuclear reactor. But when I found out, that's for mathematicians, why it burned up, I'm going, how could you do this? No watertight doors to protect the electrically operated emergency cooling pump that you have to have even after you push the control rods back in. Yeah. Would have saved it. And what I've learned when I looked in this engineers, the mathematicians calculate risk. They did a beautiful job of making the reactor earthquake proof. It shook and it shook and it shook and it shook and it shook. Everything's fine. The mathematician ruled. 20 minutes later, the tsunami came in over the seawall, drowned the emergency cooling pumps. And yeah. that's why it melted down. They didn't see it. Yeah. I can see the water filling up the site. I know exactly what's going to happen to that basement. Yeah. And, and all I have to know about that reactor is that pump doesn't run. I'm in so much trouble. It's like horrible, completely horrible. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a nuclear meltdown. It doesn't it's get much worse It's an electric pump. It doesn't run underwater. Yeah. Period. And and you make the case, and you've made this case for many years, that if we continue to take these individuals who have such great potential to be able to see this kind of thing and waste them by letting them be in basements playing video games, it's to our own peril. Is that correct? Oh, it is. It is. Now, let's look at one of the ways to get off of video games. I have now talked to five or six young adults or the parents of young adults where the thing that got them off of video games is car mechanics. And they slowly introduced car mechanics and the individual found, I asked one of them, why did you stop playing video games? He said, cars are more interesting. Motors are more interesting. And one of them's working for the railroad now. That, and so my kind of mind would be, is the ones getting addicted to video games and, and they're not going anywhere. Yeah. That, that's the thing that's a problem. And we need these skills. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I also reviewed the Boeing Max crash, and that was another, it started out as a visual thinking mistake, and then it morphed into a bad business judgment. But, I'm but going, I, perhaps you know, if mine's it, like yours, we'll sharp, get the Sharpie pen. Imagine if this sticks out under the cockpit window about this far. It measures air angle, tells you if the plane's stalling. Which, mm. you know, go up like this, that's a stall really bad in an airliner, a paper airline, paper airplane will go up and stall, and then go back down like that. And it tells you if the plane is going to stall, which is something you don't want. Yeah. Only problem is normally it just tells it's on an indicator on the instrument panel. They wired it straight into a computer system that they didn't tell the pilots about. And nobody asked, what happens if I just break this fragile little thing? Hmm. The plane thinks it's stalling when it's not stalling and keeps shoving the nose down. Oh, dear. Yeah. And when I found out what an angle of attack sensor was, I looked it up online, and then I looked at them on every 
plane at the airport. I'm like this out the window, just looking at him. I'm now seeing one on a small airplane. The jet bridge is like that far from it. And how could you trust a single delicate sensor? Why are the plane's flight controls in it to it and not tell it pilots? Yeah. How could yeah. You? And the, in the beginning, they just didn't see it. Well, this is part of the reason why the New York Times is quoted as saying, we are so lucky to have Dr. Temple Grandin. That's a pretty amazing quote well, to have I, somebody I, say that about I, you. From uh, the and the thing is, we need these skills. And when I, I uh, first, you know, somebody should have said, hey, you got two angle of attack sensors. Why don't you wire it to both of them? Right. The plane has two, one on each yeah. side. Yeah. Like, how could you do this? Well, it's mind boggling when you think about it, when you hear that ex explanation, Temple, there is no excuse for that. That's... Well, I, 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 you know, I've read about it and I, I have to look it up, find out what it was. Wow. Next flight I went on, I'm like, mm, like noticing. Okay. <laughs> like trying them on every single airplane. Uh, now I'm going to be looking for it on Friday when I fly. Um, all right. I want to talk a little, because now well, you've outlined the problem. Solved the problem now. Don't worry about, about okay. it now. They have I'm completely fixed it. Okay. It's wired the two of them. Everything is going to be, and they've totally changed the programming on the computer. It's going to be fine now. All right. I've been, I've been on that particular airplane. Uh, I had some of their coffee. That plane makes really good coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least there's that. So I've right, been on it four or five times. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Uh, all right. But since we've outlined the problem now and, and, and what the repercussions are, if we don't start solving the problem, well, what, we, what do we do? We recognize what's happening in schools is very highly verbal. Yeah. And the other problem you have the kids that are math geniuses that are just the opposite of me. And they're making them do math uh, sequentially showing the steps. That's not how these kids think. But I just had That's a kid graduate. Think. Exactly. But I just had a kid graduate from high school and thank everything that's holy that I met you when I met you because my son was, I think he was in like fifth or sixth grade when I met you. And one of the first things you said to me was, how is he at math? And I said, it's so weird. He can do math stuff, but he's struggling in math at school. And you said, you know what? Don't worry about it. That's the baby math. Don't let him get stuck on that. Put him on Khan Academy and let him program, which I did. Good. And it was life-changing for him, Temple. But if somebody had never, if I hadn't met you, I would have struggled the whole time and thought that my kid couldn't do math. Well, you're um, saying that verbal thinkers do it, do it step by step. Math geniuses don't do math that but way. But how do you fight that for your child's school? Well, this example? is the problem. And yeah. we are screening out of definitely my kind of mind. Let's go over yeah. what the different minds are good at. Okay. My kind of mind, object visualizer. We are mechanics animal behavior, photography, and art, okay. and industrial design. Now, the visual, spatial, uh, mathematical mind, computer programming, mathematics, chemistry, physics, all of that kind of stuff. It's uh, abstract patterns. Yeah. I'm a picture thinker that are pattern thinkers. And then, of course, you have the people that think in words. Yeah. And then you've got a lot of people that are mixtures, but usually one type of thinking kind of predominates. Like Betsy, my co-author for a visual thinking book, um, she's a very extreme verbalizer. We've had fascinating conversations just talking about the different ways we think. I'm and bad. she, we worked perfect as a team. I do the rough drafts. Betsy like rearranges it, smooths everything out. We're a great. She team sounds together. wonderful. Can I borrow? Recognizing <laughs> the different skills can work in complementary ways. Yeah, amazing. But but so here I am. Let's say I'm a parent and I've got a kid who's in sixth grade. And, and I, I see, based on what you've said, that there is some affinity for the math kinds of things, but they're in school and school is saying, we're not going to give him any credit unless he shows this, his work. And well, shows that's not how they think. I understand and, that. But what argument do I make? To the you know teacher? what? Let's just, get, let's just get the college math books out. They don't they like this verbal kind of math. Let's dig up the old algebra books out of the mm -hmm. attic where they're all numbers and just give them to them. Okay. And let them test out of high school math class. Just let All them right. test out of them. That's pretty That's amazing. What I would do. That's pretty amazing. I, you know, I, for us, we struggled until we got to seventh grade. And in seventh grade, they tested the kids math-wise 
on skills that they hadn't learned. And then they separated them and, and he was in an accelerated class. But until then, I constantly struggled with these teachers who were like, yeah, he got the answer right, but he but he failed the test because he didn't show the steps. But that's not how they think. You see, that's the verbal way of doing math. And I have run into over, over, over again, parents telling me the same thing over and again. Yeah. I've probably talked to 20 different parents over the last 10 years about them forcing their kid to do the math step by step. And that's not how they think. Yeah. And I've argued with these teachers, Temple, and it's hard because they're like, well, that, it's my class. This is how we're doing it. Um, what I, at one point, what I did was I hired a math tutor to help explain it to him so that he could understand it, that he was like, oh, fine. And then he could show the math that they wanted. Well, he could do that. And the other thing I'd do is just move my head in math and, and, and move my head in pure math, geometry books, algebra books, I uh, love this idea. Go and, to an old bookstore and, and an eight-year-old can just test out of a high school math test. There you go. That ought to end the issue. Okay. So so that's the mathematical mind. For yeah. the mind that is like yours, I feel like, and help me if I'm wrong here, that part of the issue is that these kids, if you don't engage them enough, they get bored. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So... So talk to me a little bit about what is engaging for that mind. How do we keep them involved enough so that they can be learning the kinds of things that they need to learn? Because I see that when, as an ex-teacher, when you engage those minds, man, they do amazing well, they things. But if you bore well, them. I was eight years old and I couldn't read. And Mrs. Deach and my mother got together. And so we got to get Temple reading. In fact, I just read something the other day that kids aren't reading by third grade. You're really in trouble. And she taught me with phonics. Let's start with a book worth reading. So we started with a book that was a fifth or sixth grade level book. The Wizard of Oz would be a great choice for my generation. And mother pinned the alphabet up on the wall. And I already knew my ABC song. That was important because the ABC song, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, that is half your sounds. She pins the alphabet up on the wall, had me memorize the sounds. A is ah and A. And then she'd read like two pages out of a book worth reading that was above my grade level and then stop in the middle of a sentence and have me sound out like three words. And then she'd cue me about um, vowels long with the E on the end. Uh, and then and and then gradually I everything done out loud, reading out loud. Yeah. She read out loud then I would read. And then gradually I read more and more. And we did this maybe four afternoons a week for an hour. And by the end of a semester, I jumped from no reading to sixth grade level reading. I'll bet. And that's how she taught me. That's amazing. Uh, the, just you know, the kind of the sight word stuff that just didn't work. And also get a book that's worth reading. Yeah. And Dick and Jane, see Dick work, work, see Sally play, play, play. That's not a book worth reading. <laughs> oh, no. And and here is Tip's tale. Uh, yes, I remember that well. Well, I, I wonder when my son was coming up, uh, the trick that everybody told me, cause I couldn't get him to learn the alphabet was that uh, leapfrog had a, a DVD out at the time that was called the letter factory. And it was this cute little cartoon okay. where, they, where it was a factory and the letters would come down the, the factory, the, you know, I got a conveyor or something like that. The conveyor. Yes. Yeah. And at three at a time, and they would come down and the letters were drawn like letters. There was the uppercase and the lowercase, but they were, you know, they used personification. So they had eyeballs and they had okay, they were cute. feet and yeah. things. They were cute. But then each one of them had an action that they would do. Like the K would go k k kick. And they yes. would have, and they that, would encourage the child to good. kick. Now, I remember learning the ABC song probably when I was five. Uh-huh. And you know, and they you know just sung it as a song. Yeah. And I used to go element of P. Right <laughs> in it, instead of L M N O P. I go A B C D E F G H I J Element of P Q R S M T U V W and X Y Z. Now I know my ABCs. And I didn't realize how many sounds were in that until like a couple of years ago. I'm going, wait a minute, that song's got half the sounds. Yeah. And yeah. I knew that song before mother's reading lesson started. Interesting. Interesting. And I very quickly <clears throat> became an excellent reader. And I don't know what would happen if I hadn't learned to read. And I was reading well, about just today. They figure if they can't get kids really reading by third grade, you're in trouble. Yeah. 
And Mrs. Uh, Peach uh, went to my mother and said, we've got to work on this. This is bad. She, Temple can't read at all. Yeah. Well, it is important to target that if if they're if they're not reading. And it can well, be hard for some families and for some kiddos. I love how your mother taught it and she made it very visual. For me, that you, I was recommended by other autism parents that DVD and it, okay, boy, well, he got it. And that's, okay, that's great. You had that DVD. He got it. He uh, loved it. Okay. And I swore by that DVD. I don't oh, know if they still make it, but it was amazing. Well, hopefully they still make it. But the thing that worked for me was just singing that song and pinning the alphabet up on the wall. And the mother would say A and uh, you know, and, we, and, and then get me to practice the sounds. But she and made it visual for you. Reading. And then a book that's worth reading. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. My my big recommendation was always A Wrinkle in Time. Okay, that's fine. But they, uh, my generation, the, the children's book was The Wizard of Oz, and that's written about yeah. a sixth grade level. And yeah. that that's uh, another book that she had me read was about Clara Barton, a famous nurse. Oh, there you go. And that was uh, probably fifth or sixth grade, fifth grade level book. It was now, actually above grade level was the book that she started with. I'm curious, since you read the book about Clara Barton, and I can remember reading that book when I was around that age too, did it make you want to be a nurse? Not really. <coughs> um, some of the other things, books that really got me interested in, in career was a book about famous inventors. Amazing. And Amazing. That, I had that book either in the third or fourth grade, and I loved reading that. I knew how to read by the time I got that. And that motivated me. I was really interested in inventing things. And that's like why who of those inventors really flipped your switch? Well, I really liked the Elias Howe and the sewing machine, the uh, the uh, grain harvesting equipment, cotton gin, as I could see mechanically how those worked. And the thing that's interesting in the patent office is that originally all the patents were mechanical devices. They would have been made by my kind of non-mathematical mind. In yeah. fact, when the patent office first started, you had to make a scale model, working model of your device. Ooh. And unfortunately, they got destroyed in a couple of fires, I think, they had at the patent office. Mm. But that would have been my kind of mind. A so and now, mind. now when an inventor creates something, they have to hire somebody to, to do the... You know, I, I know because I know people who've invented stuff, they have to hire somebody to be able to do the thing to be able to turn in the patent because it's outside their skill level. Um, well, you see, now you've got patents for things like business methods and stuff like that. Some of that stuff, I think. Yeah. A patent is supposed to be totally original. In fact, there was a ruling where discoveries are not patentable. Now, the thing you use to do the discovery is patentable. Yeah. But if you discover a new planet, for example, you can't patent it. Well, thank goodness for that. Yeah. Um, thank goodness for that. So... Uh, if, so as a parent, if you're trying to really encourage, you see that your child is a visual learner, and you want to expose them to a bunch of different things. Is This is basically what we're saying, right? Or oh, all yes. the I thinkers. Want to expose it's them, I want to expose the math learner, all the learners. I In the 50s, like in elementary school, we had art, sewing. I had embroidery when I was in third grade. Um, and then I had a toy sewing machine that actually sewed in the fourth grade. I loved it. It was one of my favorite things I made. It's called a Singer Sew Handy. And I made costumes for the school play with it. Love it. And Love it. and so sewing, woodworking, and art. And yeah. cooking I hated. And I was <laughs> one of the first um, girls to get into, um, into woodworking class in fifth grade. But if I hadn't been exposed to tools growing up, yeah. I, and then, you you know, they take out the shop classes. The, the kids like me are playing video games in the basement when they ought to be designing factory equipment or yeah. designing stuff for power plants or for stuff that's really a lot more important than video games. Or One of the things fixing yeah. water systems that are falling apart around the, all around the country. One of the things that we loved, and I don't, I don't know how often they're doing them now. You know, I think everything is back going after the pandemic, but but the two major hardware stores, both Home Depot and Lowe's, would feature a workshop a certain Saturday every month yeah, where the kids could come and build they, a kit. They need it was to free. Be involved in this stuff, yeah, and and you've got to expose kids to interesting things to get them interested in interesting things i got really interested in an optical illusion room and my science teacher said well you need to figure out how to build it 
They weren't going to tell me how to build it. There was no internet then to look it up. But a lot of kids aren't getting exposed to enough stuff. Yeah. You take something like theater, for example. I wasn't that interested in being in the play, but I loved scenery and I loved costumes. Now, that's something that can turn into a career. And I use that singer so handy to sew stuff for the school play. Well, I would love to see one of the costumes. Is, is there a picture well, somewhere? Does costumes, your mother have a picture? Kids in the, I was in fourth grade. The third grade kids had to dress up as carrots. And uh, <laughs> they made the carrot tops out of out of green freight paper that I sewed on my singer so handy. I figured out how to get sewed freight paper on it. I love it. I love it. Well, that's something I was doing in fourth grade. And you can actually look that machine up on the internet. It's uh, And they can buy it on eBay. <laughs> I think I had one of them, Temple, because I had a sewing machine and, and when you, I was little. You it, and it made a chain, yeah. made a chain stitch, and I loved it. That was one of my favorite things. You see, but that's making stuff. Well, making. I've always said that sewing is construction. It is it's just a different it has, material. It's just soft materials. Yeah, it feels just stiff. Yeah, but it's the same principles. Pattern. Well, I, yeah. I have been in a car with you when we, we uh, there was one time we were going to the airport and I was dropping you off and they were doing construction on the Dallas airport and there were all these trucks and loaders and all of this stuff. And you and I were having this very interesting conversation, but I saw instantly we got within 10 feet of the construction and I lost you. You were like into it. You were noticing what they were doing. And it was clear, it was clear that you are, a, you are somebody that that is a passionate thing for you. You were fascinated by that. And it made me think about all the kids that we know that if they see a front end loader, boy, they're, they're fascinated by that. Um, but as a parent, when you see your kids being interested in that kinds of things, do we get them the, the toy version of that? Well, I, do I mean, we... For, for six-year-old, you obviously have to give them a toy one. But also, okay, Legos, but one of them, Legos yeah. are great. But one of the mistakes that people make is they don't graduate to tools. Okay. I'm seeing, I'm seeing um, smart kids building amazing things with Legos as a teenager, and tools were never introduced. Yeah. And, and then there'll be other kids that are going to, there'll be a music kid or a math kid. And, but you don't know until you're exposed to lots of different things. Yeah. And too many of my kind of mind is playing video games in the basement when they ought to be uh, fixing the water system or making yeah. sure the wires don't fall off the towers and start fires. Has anybody ever taken you to one of the first robotics competitions, Temple? Well, I've seen them. I've seen videos of them. And the thing is, let's take robotics. Okay, that's, mm -hmm. that's a great activity. My kind of mind makes the robot. The yep. mathematician programs it. Yep. You see, well, I, some I, the first time I went to one of those first robotics tournaments, and they have different levels for for yeah. viewers who are interested. You can start with kids as early as kindergarten, um, and they do little Lego things. Yeah, and, that's right. To juice it, and then it gets you know grade school, and then there's high school, and then there's beyond. But when I got involved with it, my son was was in high school, and they give an assignment. That's to right. All so the that teams. I'm fully aware of. And they say, you know, you got to build a robot and there are these 12 tasks on the playing field and you have to be able to compete with two other robots to get as many points as possible. And you have to do the task. Yeah. And, or get I points. That, and, and I think some of the robots have gotten too expensive, um, you which, well, you know, which puts it out of reach. But I saw some really cute little robot that was um, a kind of a junkyard robotics thing where you were given the electronics were provided and then you just had yes. to make it out of things like bicycle sprockets and, and, and I loved it. And just, you know, things like that with a very, and I saw a lot train. of, a lot of the minds that you're talking about out at these tournaments, That's right. Temple. That's that, right. That, but, that, my kind of, but you see one, this is, there's the clever engineering part of the robot. That's the mechanics. That's my yes. kind of mind. And then the mathematician programs. I was just up at a really nice dairy and they had a fancy, uh, robotic milking thing for milking the cows where they go in she gets fed and then this machine milks her automatically and the dairyman modified it and the equipment company ended up copying the modification he says yep the mechanical part i stop at the software i don't touch the software you Got see it. that's somebody else's that's the math more mathematical kids job i tried programming me and bill gates had the exact same computer we had access to the exact same computer I had to drop the class. 
he took oh. off with it. <laughs> but he was being both exposed. You see, that's the thing that's so important. He took off with it, and I could log on, and that was about it. And I dropped the class. Couldn't do it. But you've done so many other things. Yeah, with that's your life, right. Which but are important. I got exposed. Yes. Yes, you got exposed. I think that's a really an important takeaway for parents because I, I, I don't know. I think sometimes parents are afraid that, uh, you know, because things can be expensive, but I think to try things and expose them, often it's free. <laughs> well, um, I think that the, the robotics doesn't have to be expensive. I really liked this yeah. one school and they had very strict size and weight requirements. Like if the robot didn't fit in this box, you couldn't use it. If it weighed over a certain amount, and then you had to make it out of like thin plywood and cardboard and, and just old junk. And they provided uh, like some electronic components. And so a robot would have cost less than $200. Yeah. You well, know, that, I, that's something that's, uh, you know, that a low income school could do. And absolutely. it takes just as much, you know, in, in, in genius and, and inventiveness to build a, something out of thick cardboard. Yes. Because they restricted the weight too, where you so you had to get creative, and then it has to do a task. But exactly. I saw another robotics thing where each robot costs like twenty thousand dollars. Well, that's oh, I don't oh that's know just ridiculous. That. Yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. ridiculous. Let's but I will forward. say, I will say that the first robotics programs they're they're funded by towns, so that there are there are schools that that have them. People can look it up uh, in your mm -hmm. area to see, but there are libraries that sponsor them and and townships that sponsor them all around the world no and and when, it's a great but, it's a great activity i'm sorry about interrupting this is still a problem i have with timing yeah this is still my processor speed still something i have a problem with it interrupting i know i do it i try not to do it but uh, oh but well, i want where but when it comes to industry we're paying the price like yes. just before COVID. And in the first, very first part of visual thinking, right in the very first part of my book, visual thinking, um, I talk about a trip I did in 2019, right before COVID shut everything down. I went to four places. I went to two state-of-the-art pork processing plants where the, most of the equipment was imported from Holland. I went to a poultry plant where the equipment came from, in a hundred shipping containers from Holland. And then I went to the Steve Jobs Theater and the structural glass walls came from Italy and Germany. And I'm going, we're not making it anymore. Then I started researching for the book and I discovered that the state of the art electronic chip making machine for electronics, for computer chips, it's built in Holland. Invented here, built in Holland. And that goes back to taking out the skilled trades out of the schools because you, it, it, there's plenty of mechanical parts on that machine. There's two parts of engineering. There's the mathematical part, and then there's more industrial design visual part. And the part we're really losing is the is the visual thinker part. People like me. Yeah. And and, and that means more hands-on experience. That's right. Training. And we need to be doing hands-on classes and taking them out. It's a gigantic, huge, gigantic mistake. And all the people like to keep things like wastewater treatment going you know, electrical stuff going, they're retiring out. The people yeah. I worked with that built my stuff, and some of them were autistic, undiagnosed, they're all retired out. Yeah. And there's a few left, and they haven't retired yet, and then some of the few that are left, they're, they're price gouging like you just wouldn't believe on repairs. Now, I can't, I have to be vague because if there are some confidentiality concerns of course. clients, but ripping a client off five times the price it should be. Wow. You're but, it, but it seems like to me, so what's important is we've got to have some reform around education. And I'm glad that you wrote this book because maybe somebody like Jill Biden will read it and understand that we've got to get more experiential things in the classroom. But in the meantime, for parents, if you if they can't find it in the school, then they got to go find well, it. Well, then let's start doing things in the neighborhood, like yeah. maybe a retired mechanic can start introducing people to working on cars in the neighborhood just think uh, somebody could open an art class a ceramic studio uh there's just start doing things in the neighborhood i think that's what we're going to have to do because yeah. the kids are the big video game addicts let me tell you mechanics is the one thing that can get them off of video games that actually that's works amazing. i've talked to five or six cases where that's been successful 
and it was fixing cars and introducing it to them in low doses. You win yeah. them gradually. You don't do it all of a sudden. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. So the book is is out today as as you're, we're airing this, and that's everybody right. can get it in all the major booksellers. That's right. Um, it's important that uh, you know that we say that it's already a bestseller, um, and it doesn't even come out until tomorrow. But it it's also important, I think, to note that no matter how you're entering the circle of this conversation, whether you are the person who's on the spectrum or you love someone who's on the spectrum or you're somebody working in a, in an industry where like everything else, you know, there, we keep hearing about this hiring shortage and how there aren't enough people. And yet I keep hearing my friends and, and, and their kids talking about they've applied for all these jobs, but as you've said, they get screened out. How can they, in this in this market where everybody's so desperate for good workers, how can we help our kids and what can they do so that they can, you talk about the back door, but if we don't know where to find the back door, how well, do we get them talk in? About, let's talk about just learning work skills. The problem is most people don't see the back door. I yes. saw the back door in the beginning. There's a scene in the HBO movie about me where I go up and I get the business card of the editor of our state farm magazine. Cause I knew if I wrote for that magazine, that would help my career. And I saw that back door and I got the card and I produced the article. Yeah. Now it was just luck that he was at this small livestock event I went to, but I saw the door and yeah. went for it. Most people don't see the door. The back doors are everywhere and people don't see them. Well, they're building this great big, huge warehouse thing. It's a gigantic back door. Yeah. In a few months, they'll be hiring. And if the magic wand was waved, and I was now 18 years old, but I kept all my knowledge. Yeah. I just flunked algebra, flunked out of high school. I head straight for that big back door. And I'd pay my dues, unloading the trucks, yeah. pay my dues, learn every job on the floor, and work up. Because I want to design the next one. Yeah. I just and kept... doable. That is doable. I have yeah. seen that career track many yeah. times. I just keep thinking about there was a young man before the pandemic that his really lovely human being, very social and loved being in a movie theater. Not so much sitting and watching the movie, but loved the whole atmosphere of being in a movie theater and his ambition in life. What he wanted to do more than anything else was to be a ticket taker at a major movie house well, he certainly can learn to do that that's well very... and he and he went he was part of a job program where yeah. he went and he learned a whole bunch of job skills to be able to do that but then it came time for him to put in the application which was online oh we're going and... to have to short circuit a lot of this I was talking with a number of companies about changing the interview process like microsoft for example has them come in and and they can do some programming stuff get a chance to show the skills I've talked to other companies that are very amenable to changing some of their interview process. And then I talked to another company just the other day and they go, we can't change that. Exactly. Now, what That's what we ran up against. Well, this is a problem and it's yeah. going to have to be changed because the really social people are not going to be the best mechanic, for example. They just yeah. are not going to be. And the very best mechanic is probably going to be horrible socially. He needs to show the car that he rebuilt or the engine he rebuilt to the engineering department. That's how yeah. I sold jobs. I showed off my drawings and I didn't show them to the HR department. I showed them to the plant manager, to the engineering department, the people that would care about it. Now we need to be changing how they do some of this hiring and you need short circuit that online stuff. And you never know who can open the back door. I went to a big tech company and I sat next to a guy in one of their little cafes and he was working on hardware, computer yeah. hardware. And I said, how did you get this job? Yeah. And this was recent, pretty recent, right before COVID. He said, my professor knew somebody at the company. Yeah. That's, that's what it back all comes door. down to. We've got to find those back doors. They are everywhere. And people are not seeing them. And yeah. some, the other thing I found when it comes to hiring people that are different, I've been seeing patterns now in the companies. There's kind of three types. The ones that have the super good programs have high up executives that are not anything to do with anything to do with the disability. Yeah. And then you have ones that had a great program and their vice president level champion suddenly left 
and the program deteriorated. And then you have ones where a disability silo forms inside the corporation. That does not work very well. I, I, mm. Those are the patterns. But um, high level vice presidents are getting involved. Uh, that's how things change. Yeah. Like Walgreens, for example, and there's a book about it, they um, reconfigured their warehouses so that people with intellectual disabilities could work in the warehouses because they didn't have to read. And they were outperforming the regular warehouses. Of course. Yeah, you of see course. that? Makes sense to me. But yes. I know to a so lot of people that's get, news. We've got to get, <clears throat> but I'm unfortunately seeing too many disability silos. I went to one company where they had me give a talk, and this was live. This was pre-COVID, but not 20 years ago. This stuff's all in the last seven or eight years. And, and I talked all, you know, general thing to a lot of employees. But then afterwards, I just met with the disability people. I said, where's the regular HR department? Where's the vice president of operations? Yeah. They should be at this meeting and they were not. And since yeah. I'm bashing some stuff, I'm not going to give out the names of the companies. But No, I understand. But this is, is a problem. Tech companies probably have done some of the best job of reaching out. So that's going to get your math kids. But that's not going to do anything for my kind of mind. My kind of mind needs to be showing off the car engine they've rebuilt. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff that my kind of mind needs to... I well, you've always that. said a digital portfolio is important. Yeah, you've got to have, have a portfolio. To sh you have to. I, I learned to sell my work. Now, right here, I my drawings. I, I already showed that. I learned to show mm -hmm. off my drawings. Yeah. Well, your drawings are elegant. And and that's how I sold jobs. I also was very good. I I'd read in the meat magazine. And somebody was building a plant. And I'd call up and I go, engineering office, please. And they said, well, that's Mr. Smith. And I go, what is direct extension? And then I'd call them at 1130 when they come in for lunch. Mm, that's funny. And then I'd send them a packet of stuff. Well, you were relentless. On, on the web's page. You were relentless, uh, Temple, which I think is absolutely amazing. I, I, I think that playing video games takes that away from some of our kids. They are not. As well, yeah, I'm one of the kids do a little video game playing. I'm doing. I remember one time I played a video game and I thought I played it for 30 minutes. I played for like three hours and go. Mm, yeah, man. time um, time goes but by. The way the but the the kids who get addicted to video games, mechanics, and we need so many people okay. to work on mechanical things. And I worked with people that were mechanical geniuses, and they were definitely autistic, had yeah. their own businesses. And then you, they need someone to help them run the business. Like in some cases, right. their wife ran the business part of the business. Right. You know, the bookkeeping, the billing, uh, paying for materials, paying pay, uh, employees, doing all that kind of stuff. I want to ask you about one of the things that's in, in the press about your book that you say that parents should stop asking their kids, what do you want to be when they grow up? That this is not the well, appropriate question. Well, the thing question. is, is that is that I didn't never dream of being in the cattle industry. I got into that because I was exposed to it as a teenager. Actually, when I was really young, I did want to be a scientist. And then all kids get interested in archaeology. I mean, I was kind of into that in fourth grade. Yeah. When we were studying Egyptians and things like that. But I. Uh, but you are a scientist. Yeah, but I am a scientist. That's right. And I love, and the whole business of inventing things is something I like. And my and grandfather an was, was a co-inventor of the autopilot for airplanes. And oh, he's yeah. a mathematician and he worked with an Asperger's guy that was definitely autistic. They came up with a crazy new idea for an autopilot. They tinkered and tinkered and tinkered in a loft. They got it to work. It was in every plane during World War II, but the stolen version was in every plane. Uh -huh. This is where they needed a verbal thinker. They needed a lawyer. Yeah. And if they'd had a lawyer, it would not have been ripped off. Amazing. Well, but you say that asking what do you want to be when you grow up is not the right question. Well, the I, right it, question I, is what are you good at? Well, I want to work on, I was good at art and mother always encouraged my ability in art. Yeah. That was really, really important. But that has ended up being an important part of what you do. Well, yes, because drawing is based on art. Yes, you but it's how you communicate like your ideas. Movement. Now it's me that's interrupting, but that's how you communicate your ideas. Your drawings are elegant, and it was it becomes another language. How well, you draw. One of the problems we got now 
is I looked at some construction drawings about three years ago. I thought were horrible, steel yeah. and concrete work, and I left the reinforcing rod wasn't drawn on the drawings. They just put in the written spec. And I said, I'm marking in all this rod, and you take that back to a fancy engineering company and get them to draw that rebar in there correctly on that drawing. Yeah. That was three years ago. Wow. But that's Amazing. recent. And and so the thing is, you need my kind of mind. Yes, absolutely. And 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 I'm really concerned about skill loss. Well, I think it's we all serious. should be concerned about that. But I but I want to say, because we're getting down to it in time, I want to say that uh, the book is available and that there's really something for everybody in the book, that everybody can benefit from this book. And it allows you to look at things in a different way, which is a very powerful thing, no matter who you are in this equation. Well, there, is a, chapter, there is a chapter in there on neurodiversity mm -hmm. and kind of the history of that. And a lot of people are identifying as neurodiverse, which would then broaden it. But we need those neurodiverse minds. Amen. Our economy Amen. needs them, and they need them really badly. Yes, absolutely. So uh, in, the, in these last couple of minutes that we have left, uh, Dr. Grandin, I have a couple of questions for you that are just okay. like, I, I always like to t touch base with you and say, what right now, what drives you? What's like the most exciting thing to you right now and that you get real excited about? Well, I want to see the kids that think differently, that are neurodiverse, get out and get great jobs that they love, where they can do something positive, constructive in a career that they love. And that's going to be my main emphasis now. I'm in my 70s now. So that's my main emphasis, helping the kids that are different get into great careers where they can do constructive, good things in jobs they love. I love that. And so you brought it up that at, at the age of 75 now, I, I asked you this question the first time I met you, uh, is, is there a retirement plan or is that just not a part of who you are? Well, I've thought about what happens when I have to have a walker. And let me tell you, I'm going to trick out my walker. <laughs> well, I get social about this. I got to decorate it like my kid's bike. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and, and I thought, and I thought about what would I do when I get, well, I could volunteer at the science museum yeah. and get kids interested in science. That's yeah. something I could probably do. Um, but is I, that uh, a plan or are you going to stay teaching? I see it makes you. Well, I, I can't, I'm going to keep teaching for a long time. I'd have to be really incapacitated to stop teaching because yeah. I could do that in a wheelchair. Yeah. I could still teach. And I probably wouldn't, uh, going out to the experiment station would be hard, but. I could still teach in the classroom, but I, I, uh, I want to see, we got to start looking at what people can do. Yes. Amen to that. That's, that's the thing. And I get bored if I was just sitting around that, you see the, my book, visual thinking, that was my COVID lockdown project. Yeah. Every speaking engagement, everything I had was canceled for an entire year. Everything yeah. was canceled. And yeah, but that gave and you I, something to do. Well, yeah. And I called up Betsy. And I said, let's do a book. And she's, and she's sitting around bored. She says, well, I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> does Betsy hire out or does, she, or does she exclusively work with you? Well, she's a, an, a, a book agent. So mm. she works so, and owns a book agent, author agency company. So she still had to do that work during well, lockdown, that's... but that was all being done from home. But I'm sure she loved it. They shut right down now. their New York office for about a year. Wow. And then she just worked at her from her home. And um, we did most stuff on the phone. Yeah. Well, and so I guess one of my other questions for you is what's left on your bucket list? What are the things that you are really wanting to do? Is there any place you want to go or anybody? You oh, want man. Someone meet? like put me, on a, put me on one of SpaceX's rockets. I'd like to do that. Elon, are you <laughs> listening? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that'd be something I'd like to do. Yeah. I've always been, I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. I had to drop all the high math classes. Yeah. I couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to say that one of the biggest, most important days of my life, uh, other than when my child was born, was being able to go and tour NASA with you with a couple of astronauts and just getting to geek out, watching you geeking out with the astronauts was one of the highlights of my life. Well, they were interested in how I observed stuff. We went in the shuttle mock-up and there was this unprotected switch that said pyro. And I said, <sighs> and I said what is that doing? They said, well, it'll blow open the cargo hold. We said, don't you think you ought to have a 
right on that switch. Yeah, seriously. And he said, you're a really good observer. I don't remember that. I don't know where I must have been that. Was that was something, something I noticed. And there's a little guard that you can get that you have to lift up, though. So you can't accidentally bump that switch. That's amazing. And I remember there was, a, there, was a, that. Uh, there was a glove that um, that they had that they could, yep, could I remember see. putting that glove on. And that and you had some real issues with the glove. And well, you, were, I, you were talking to one of the other scientists that was there about what happens because there were all these wires going up the fingers of the glove. Well, that was the robotic was hand. Yes. And and uh, <laughs> then I was thinking about, well, if I break one of those wires and how am I going to fix that weightlessness? Um, and you get into things that just get too fragile. You see, this is where on something like making that robotic hand, you need my kind of mind to work on the mechanics. And, and then you see the mathematician and my kind of mind need to work together on that robotic hand. And this is exactly what I got to see because I was standing there and the the astronaut scientist that you were talking to, it was exactly what you're talking about because you were saying, what happens when one of those gets severed and how are you going to repair it? And they were so fixated on the fact that, no, it works, that they weren't seeing what you were seeing. And it well, was the, the most fascinating is, conversation. Is those strings they had in there are going to wear out. And when they yeah. wear out, they break. Yeah. So I was thinking about, now, how can I replace that and wait, since I'm thinking of having some stiff wires, I could think I could shove down through there. Yeah. Um, you can't drop a string through it in white no. Yeah. But it, yeah, it was break and it has to be repairable. It was so fascinating to watch. You know, there's that scene in what's the Mars movie with uh, Matt Damon? The Martian. Yes, The Martian. And where we get to see him, you know, he says, I'm going to have to science the crap out of yeah. this. Yes, and I right. got to watch you stand there and think and, and you know, how would you science the crap out of fixing the hand and weightlessness? It was well, one of the things they were talking about, like on long space, you know, like up in the space station, there's stuff that has to be fixed. Yeah. And um, this stuff is not fun to fix, like toilet. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But there, there's, um, you need people that can just fix stuff. Yeah. And yeah. I read a book called How to Astronaut, and um, they were describing, like, you know, this thing on the helmet was hurting his head, and that glove, like, chafed his hand. He put Band-Aids on it. And... It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. They, now, you see, you need all the different kinds of minds to work on these things. Yeah. Well, have because, you been, go ahead. Yeah, because when I went to Cape Kennedy, I found that the raccoon in the base, the launch pad base, and nobody else saw it. I saw it come out and go down the steps. <laughs> and what did they do when you told them? Well, I, I said, this fueling equipment I saw that I don't think I want him around. And, yeah. Yeah. And I'm imagining what he could do to it. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you've been keeping a close eye on some of the launch stuff. Well, I've been keeping a close eye on that rocket while I had them, you know, then it's got a leak in the fuel, the quick disconnect between the rocket and the, and the, and the uh, fueling system. All the raccoon didn't pee in it or something. Oh my goodness. Oh my <laughs> yeah, goodness. But, I, but you see, that was five years ago that I saw that raccoon. That right. was five years ago. And, right. but nobody else knew it was in there. Which is I another. I wasn't looking for a raccoon. I just saw this little weird motion. And I yeah. looked over there and I saw it go down the steps. But this is exactly what you're talking about. We need all of the different That's kinds right. of thinkers and all That's of the different right. kinds of minds because you saw it and nobody else had. No, I said, Did you know there's a raccoon overnighting in the base? Did you know? Did you know? And then we went inside the base and I saw some stuff. I didn't really want the raccoon around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I was for imagine sure. what he could do to it. And I explained yeah. how they choose stuff that people have handled, tool handles. That's, but what about wiring that's been handled a lot of open electrical cord? Yeah. He'll probably chew that. Well, there's probably some astronaut who owes you his life um, for you seeing that. We, okay, we uh, run out of time. We're running out, we run out of time. I just, but I just let's... cut us off. Well, no, we're still going, but he's letting us know that I got to wind it down. I do want to say, though, that the book is available now if you're watching this. We'll, we'll have Temple come back on soon live so that you guys can be asking live questions. But Temple, Dr. Grandin, it's just always such a pleasure and it's so fun to talk to you. Well, it's been great to be on the show and thank you for having me.
I've missed getting to see you in person. And I hope that sometime in this next year, I get to see you in person at one of your many things that you're out at. Well, I'm getting um, out and I'm doing some things. I'm just doing a variety of different things. And it's good to get back out again. I just went to two beautiful dairies up in Quebec. That was a great trip. Well, that's amazing. And yeah. I hope that this book, it's already a bestseller. Uh, so we hope that that just continues and that people get an opportunity to read this and and really take in what you're saying because there's a lot to be gained here. Well, I want to help the kids that are different get great careers they're going to love. And the thing, and I tell business people, you need the neurodiverse minds. Amen to business that. People, you need them. Amen to that. Will you do me okay. a favor and give your mother my best? I sure will. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Grandin. Okay. You take care. I I'm will. just going to say you. goodbye to everybody. We're back tomorrow. We have a wonderful author that's on the show tomorrow, a young man on the spectrum who is one of the Dan Marino fellows. And he wrote the hand on books that we featured before in our toy guide. So John Miller will be with us and we're really excited to be talking with him. And don't forget on Thursday, it's let's talk all the things with Rachel Bird. Uh, such a fun hour. Make sure that you're here with us then, but we'll be back tomorrow until then. Thank you to Dr. Grandin and thank you to all of you for watching until then give your kiddos a hug for me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. Goodbye. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.